Hi, welcome to Discovery. This is the Apollo spacecraft. Actually, this section where the astronauts live is called the command module. We're at North American Aviation, where Apollo was built in Downey, California. Apollo is 11 by 13 and a half feet in size. That doesn't sound very big, does it? But it's the biggest spacecraft we've ever had. ABC science editor Jules Bergman, who's covered every one of our manned space shots, is with us to tell us how Apollo works and what it'll mean to our space program. Jules, how big a step forward is Apollo? Bill, Mercury and Gemini were sort of like Volkswagens. Apollo is more like a large family station wagon. And it has to be. The three pilots inside Apollo, with all their food and equipment, have to live in that spacecraft for three days going to the moon and three days coming back. That's their home. Now, this would be the command module, a model of it right here, this right. portion, right? Now, we know that it's 11 by 13 and a half feet in size, but how big is it in relationship to the entire spacecraft? Well, this model of the Saturn V moon rocket, Bill, is the best way to show that. Here on top of it is the command module itself, this spec. I see. That's what we've been talking about. That sits atop the 364 foot high moon rocket itself. 364 feet figure 10 feet to a story. That would be like a 36 story building. At least. What we're seeing now is the command and service module. Right, as it sits atop the Saturn V rocket uh, in the giant vehicle assembly building at Cape Kennedy, Bill, uh, this Saturn V is called the fueling test article. It's designed to be sure that all those stages we're looking at of the rocket fit together correctly and that the whole rocket fits the launch pad. And here we see it being towed the three miles from the vertical assembly building out to launch complex 39. There's the view looking downward, 364 feet of rocket there. And there's the launch support tower near it. And we're looking up crawler row, as we call it, uh, toward the launch pad. And here's the crawler transporter moving ever so slowly. It moves at one and a half miles per hour with about 18 different drivers or pilots guiding it. One and a half miles per hour toward the launch pad. And that rocket, by the way, when it's fueled, weighs 3,000 tons, Bill. The crawler transporter weighs 6,000 tons, nearly 13 million pounds in all. Well, we know now that this part is called the service module. Well, what does it really do? Well, Bill, the service module is really the storehouse of supplies for the flight, the fuel cells that give the astronauts the power for the spacecraft. The, the reserve breathing oxygen is in here. The fuel for a 20,000 pound rocket engine that's down here beneath the skirt that enables the entire spacecraft to maneuver in orbit and change its orbit. And the fuel for these tiny rocket engines, they're called thrusters, that enable the astronauts to control the attitude of the spacecraft to change the pitch, if you will, the roll, or the yaw of the spacecraft. All those supplies are stored for the entire trip in this service module, which stays with the spacecraft until just before the re-entry. I see. Now, oh, what about this structure here, Jules? Well, this is the escape tower, Bill, and it has a huge solid rocket motor in it, and it's intended to carry the entire spacecraft away from the booster rocket if anything goes wrong during the launch phase. And, of course, it's jettisoned afterward if, in case the launch does go, when the launch does go normally. I should think that this is about the most complex machine man has ever put together. It is complex, all right, Bill. More than two million parts in the command module alone. This is the clean room at North American, where the command and service modules are assembled and checked out under surgical operating room conditions to be sure there's no dust, no dirt that gets into the spacecraft. I see. And here's a technician checking out wiring bundles. They're carefully tagged to be sure the right section goes into the right part of the spacecraft. More than 15 miles of wiring in the command module alone. And here's an entire wiring harness. Some of those 15 miles going into the command module. And testing is the name of the game, Bill, in spaceflight. These are the escape tower rocket tests being held at White Sands Proving Grounds with a boilerplate spacecraft. That escape tower is powered by a 150,000 pound thrust solid rocket engine. Here it is with cameras on board. And it's designed, of course, to carry the entire command module away from the booster rocket in case anything goes wrong during launch. And in all these tests, it works superlatively. There's the boost protective cover that's called that protects the uh, command module itself from the rocket uh, exhaust going away. And now these cameras mounted aboard the command module, and this is an unmanned test, of course, show us the uh, spacecraft starting to come down, 
The pilot chutes aimed at stabilizing the spacecraft before the big uh, chutes open have begun to come out here. So there's more than one chute system. Oh, well, there's a system of really three different parachutes used. Pilot chutes, drogue chutes, and the main chutes. Pilot chute is designed to open at 25,000 feet in normal flight, then the drogue chute, and then finally, there's the mortar firing that uh, enables the drogue chute to pull out the three main parachutes. Each of them, there's the drogues coming out right this now. slow motion here. Slow motion footage, so it takes much longer than it normally would. And here are the three main chutes beginning to unreef, to unfurl as they come out of the top of the spacecraft. Each of those three main chutes, 85 feet in diameter when it opens. And one of the fail safes built in here is that any two of those main parachutes can get the spacecraft and the crew down safely without their being injured. There they are, completely open as the spacecraft descends to a normal landing. This landing, of course, was at White Sands on the desert. Apollo was designed to land on land initially. It's, it lands on water now because the uh, full landing system is not yet perfected. And these are the water tests held right here at North American with a boilerplate command module being dropped into a big tank. Tests are aimed at two things, really. Seeing how well the spacecraft hull or fuselage takes the shock of landing in the water, hmm. and then seeing how well it floats, how well it does as a boat. All that testing, but still there was the Apollo 1 tragedy. Bill, no one knew it could happen. As astronaut Frank Borman has put it, before the accident, everyone thought Apollo 1 was safe. I wouldn't have hesitated to have gotten in myself. That's the way he put it to the investigation board. Now, in the light of the accident, Apollo is going to get a new quick escape hatch so the crew can get out in a hurry if fire develops during testing or on the pad. It's going to get a new normal air system inside without high pressure oxygen in the spacecraft cabin, thus reducing the fire hazard. And some of the more flammable materials inside the spacecraft are going to be removed, new materials, less flammable materials substituted. The legacy of Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee is that because of their accident, every astronaut who ever flies an Apollo on trips in Earth orbit or to the moon will fly more safely. As it's been put very eloquently, three guys who had their eyes on the moon never even made it off the launch pad. And everyone connected with Apollo has vowed that it will never happen again. We're going inside the spacecraft with Jules Bergman and North American research pilot Tom Armstrong to see what it'll be like in an actual flight to the moon. We're inside the Apollo spacecraft, about to take a simulated trip to the moon and back with North American research pilot Tom Armstrong. Tom, how do we actually control Apollo when we're in orbit? Well, Jules, very much the same way that you do an airplane. We have a control system here, we have an instrument panel in front of us, and we have an engine which we use to take us from one place to another. How does the control stick govern the attitude of the spacecraft? Again, very similar to an airplane. We pitch nose up this way, nose down, nose right, nose left, and if we wish to roll, we can roll to the left or roll to the right, all with this one, what we call three-axis hand controller. Right. Then uh, we can use the engine uh, the same way that we do in an airplane. We point the nose of the spacecraft using the hand controller in the direction that we wish to go. We use the engine then to take us to that point. Right, and in this Apollo simulator, which is actually the spacecraft we are in, we can tell where we are. We can see the Earth below us as we whirl around in orbit. Yes, we do that through a TV camera that we have focused through this window here. And we get the uh, view of the Earth, uh, which looks very similar to what an astronaut would actually see in an Earth orbit mission. It shows the Earth about 100 nautical miles below us the way it will be. There's nothing like the face of a kid eating a Hershey bar. A face as happy as it can be. Only a Hershey bar tastes like a Hershey bar. It's the chocolate. Hershey's real milk chocolate. And if you like almonds, try the Hershey bar with almonds. The best tasting freshly roasted almonds there are. Hershey, the great American chocolate bar. Yes, right. And also now, as we head out in the simulated trip toward the moon, 
We see the star field up there through television. Yes, we have a star presentation, which uh, as the Earth fades out, we start to pick up all of the stars that you normally would see in the sky on any clear night here on Earth. And how do we use this uh, massive and talented computer here, Tom? Well, the computer is uh, what you might call uh, just a sophisticated way of counting. Uh, it's an adding and subtracting machine. Uh, we can use it to uh, compute where we are, to compute how fast we're going, and all of these uh, types of information that you need to navigate in deep space. Right. Now, I'm sitting in the senior pilot's couch, and he's actually the navigator as well. Yes. And one of the major advantages of Apollo is that it is so big that I can move forward here to the navigation station and stand up. And then looking through this versatile telescope and section you have here, I can see the stars as they would be in orbit and plot a path for us. And you can insert that into the computer. Right. Uh, you as a navigator down here would give me the information that I need and then I could push this into the computer and set up for a computation which would then tell the whole crew where we are versus where it is we wish to go. Every radio aboard the spacecraft could fail, all our radios to Earth, for example, and as long as we had the computer, the sextant and the telescope, we could still tell where we were all the time. That has been one of our number one design criteria, to be able to do what you want to do on board. On the three-day flight to the moon, we're totally independent of the Earth if we have to be. Right. And here's the way it ought to be, Tom, when that giant Saturn V moon rocket lifts off from pad 39 at the Cape. Right, we're just about to clear the launch umbilical tower there. 3,000 tons of weight in all, blasting its way up into orbit with the command module atop. Right, there are seven and a half million pounds of thrust right there. And an animated view of the scene in the control center. Now, the first two main stages of the rocket are burned out and we're being powered by the Saturn IV-B third stage, which burns out and now the fairings deploy. Right, and now you're going into what we call the transposition docking maneuver. It gets its name from the fact that we must transpose the limb from its launch housing to the front end of the command module. Right, and it begins with the pilots of the, in the command module pulling away from the limb. Right, and then they'll turn around and come back and plug into the limb using their control system. Now there's the lunar module being pulled out by the command module. Right, and we sometimes call it a lunar bug or LM. Right, we call it a lamb, uh, a bug, a lunar module. We have many uh, names for the... And here they're departing from Earth orbit, heading toward the moon. Yes, they've just left Earth orbit there. Now they're on the way to the moon. And you can see the moon in the background and the Earth just disappearing over the lunar horizon. As they go into orbit around the moon. And first, the Lamb and the mothership establish a good orbit around the moon. Right, and they have to retro to do this. And here you can see the uh, main engine firing to slow down so that they can be captured by the moon's gravity. Then, after checking out the command module in the orbit, two of the crew members get aboard the Lamb and begin to check it out. Yes, they check it out, go through a detailed uh, electronic and systems checkout, and then they'll actually separate from the command module to begin their journey down to the surface of the moon. And you can see how the two vehicles are joined by that airlock there in the center. Right, and the tunnel which they crawl through. Right. Now there's the actual separation of the limb from the command module which stays in orbit around the moon. And here's the actual uh, braking maneuver as they touch down on the moon. Right, it's very much like a helicopter landing. The uh, lunar module comes straight down. As it approaches the surface, it cuts the main engine and lands on the surface of the moon. And may all landings be that smooth. We hope so. And then one of the crew members first gets out carrying a television camera. Yes, and he then uh, takes the uh, camera over to a clear area and actually erects it so that uh, the viewers at home can get live television pictures from the surface of the moon. Right, there's the antenna set up to relay the picture. Yes, you can see it's already erected there, and uh, it will transmit pictures then from this handheld TV camera back to Earth. Right, and it's figured that first uh, visit on the lunar surface should last about 18 hours. That's about a, what we would call a nominal or average uh, amount of time, yes. Then they blast off as they're doing here. Yes, and you can see that the first stage uh, is left behind on the moon 
used for a launching platform. The descent rocket in its stage become the launching gantry for the ascent stage. Right, just like that Cape Kennedy on a regular launch pad. Right, and then they go into orbit around the moon again. Right, and here they are uh, thrusting to get back up into the same orbit that they left when they uh, separated from the command module. Here you can see the uh, lunar orbit rendezvous, as we call it, as the LEM approaches the command module, getting ready to dock and retransfer the two crewmen back to the command module. And this is the big maneuver, lunar rendezvous, which is the heart of our technique. Yes, right here now is the actual docking of the lunar module with the command module. And the two pilots in the lunar bug get aboard. They get aboard, and then the uh, LEM is jettisoned and left in uh, lunar orbit as the command module thrusts to come on back toward the Earth. And the trip back from the moon to the Earth is going to take about three days, about 68 hours, I think it's figured out. 68 hours is actually the minimum time. It could be up to 72. And then they jettison the service module as they get yes. coming to the Earth orbit. And begin their uh, atmospheric entry. You can see the shock wave forming here on the command module as they enter the atmosphere. Now you can see the uh, deployment of all of the parachute systems uh, that are on the vehicle. There's the two drogue chutes for stabilization. They're jettisoned and the pilot chutes come out, which in turn bring out the main descent parachutes. With North American research pilot Tom Armstrong, we've taken a simulated trip to the moon and back. And that is the way it should be if all goes well aboard our first manned Apollo flight to the moon. Jules, today we've learned how we can get to the moon. Now let me ask you this. Why do we want to go there? Bill, we've talked about national prestige. Many people have talked about the need to race the Russians to the moon. But I think in the end, the single biggest reason is going to be learning, plain old scientific learning. Because sooner or later in exploring the moon, we're going to discover not only how the moon began as a satellite of the Earth, but how the Earth itself began. So it's the geology, the science we'll learn, which is invaluable. It's going to be uh, difficult for anyone on the moon not just the astronauts, but people who come later and uh, begin to settle the moon, you might say, for as far as breathing and as far as climate adaptation. Well, the moon has no atmosphere. The moon does have a violent climate with days as hot as 220 or 230 degrees, nights as cold as 240 degrees. So when man comes to stay on the moon, as he will in lunar laboratories, they'll be completely shielded from the heat and cold. They'll have their own atmosphere. Man will have to be protected. There'll be low, lunar, lunar roving vehicles, which are already planned to carry astronauts 50 or 100 miles back and forth on the moon for their exploration. But the moon itself is only the beginning of the space program, Bill. Is it possible that the moon will ever be more than a place to hold all this equipment we're talking about? In other words, will there ever be cities on the moon? No one seriously thinks there'll be cities. The moon might be a way station, if you will an interplanetary refueling point for trips to Mars or beyond. There's some thought that the volcanoes of the moon, which the Russian scientists claim to have seen smoke rising from, may have hydrogen fuel beneath them. That hydrogen fuel might possibly be usable to refuel our rockets with. Isn't there an analogy here, Jules, with the ancient explorers uh, settling in the new world and discovering new territories? What do we know what is beyond the moon, Mars, Venus, and so on? We know very little, except we know that we know enough at this point to get there with our technology, with man's ingenuity, and that using a nuclear-powered rocket, which the president has now asked the Congress to appropriate the money to build, and using Apollo, using the Saturn V, man can get to Mars, for example, which very likely will be our next manned target in this planet's system of ours. I can envisage, too, some diplomatic problems. Uh, who owns what territory? Well, nobody's going to own any territory out there. One of the few things that we have agreed on in this world of ours at the United Nations is that no one's going to own planets or space. They're, they're going to be open internationally for all men to explore. The whole subject is fascinating. And remember, it's been just a little more than five years since John Glenn made our first orbital flight, a flight lasting less than five hours. Jules, thanks for being with us today and having this look at Apollo with us in our future in space. Rushing starts your taste off right.
But as the day wears on, tingle, 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 get the just brushed freshness with Pantene. The tingle tells you your breath is fresh, your mouth is clean. All day long, tingle, tingle, your breath is fresh, your mouth is clean. Sierra, portrait in majesty and peril. Sierra, the new drama series set against the sweep and grandeur of our nation's great parks, bringing you high, wide, and handsome adventure with the rangers of the National Park Service as they roam the vastness of the Yosemite. Sierra, brought to you by the producers of Adam-12 and Emergency. Jewel's Power production in association with ABC News and Public Affairs.